Good morning, church at Harpeth Heights. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me. We will be talking about John 3.16 for the second week in a row. Thanks to Steve for kicking us off last week with that. We'll also be in 1 John today and Philippians 2. So if you want to stick your thumb in those places, we can turn to them. They'll also be on the screen as we go along. Um, I stand before you this morning very grateful that... uh, um, You have responded to our news in the ways that you have. We have gotten so many kind um, words from you and also words that, you know, you've expressed sadness, and that is a blessing to us as well, even though we are sad. um, It's better than y'all being glad. (laughs) I had that experience with our staff when I told them a few days before um, last Sunday, and and they were were shocked and... and, uh, and sad as well, and that was a that was a blessing to me. So I love working with them. Uh, this this is a a circumstance that came about um, because I answered the telephone back in August, and we weren't looking uh, to go anywhere else. Um, we just renovated our house, spent every dollar we don't have, and then some dollars we still don't have, and. Um, All our family is here. We love our church so much. You guys have loved us so well. And so the process that we went through in imagining what we thought God was possibly calling us into was arduous and very difficult. And at times we just wished it would just go away and make it easier on us. But we continually felt pulled in the direction that we have decided to go. And I've told you before, I'll tell you again, I have never experienced calling as being particularly um, definite. That's not the way God has, uh, has spoken to me in my life, and I understand God. I, I have experienced uh, much more. It has been the case that I have had these options because I've been so blessed and loved, good options usually. And in this case, we had two very good options. And we don't feel necessarily, I don't feel released from you and from this calling, um, necessarily, I pray that will come. Um, but I'm, I'm sad. We are deeply sad to be doing what we're doing, but also excited. And I think those things fit within what God's heart is um, for calling God's people to, uh, to do the work of the kingdom. I would want the same. I do want the same for each of you. And so I'll have a couple more weeks, um, at least it's the plan, to be with you and to explain further. Um, but I think that's uh, what I need to say for now. Um, we will go there, and we will expect to be loved. And we will do that because of the way you have treated our family. So thank you. So God... <laughs> Love the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in, me, in him will not perish but have eternal life. For most of the first half of last year, I, uh, as the benediction, I used 1 John 4, 9, and you may remember that. And I want to read verses 8 through 12 with you this morning from, from John's letter to uh, further teach on this extremely familiar passage from John 3.16. So it says, The one who does not love, love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. May God add God's blessing to the reading of God's word. So I want to talk with you for just a few moments this morning about the uniqueness of Jesus. 
the uniqueness um, that caused John to describe him in, in chapter 3 of this gospel as well as in chapter 4 of this letter as um, God's son, God's one and only son. Jesus was a Jew and, and born into a Jewish faith whose cornerstone was monotheism. You'll recall, we've talked about it a lot from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema, where, where the, the text reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It used to be commonly thought that the idea of Jesus being God's son, it developed along the way as the gospel uh, went a little further and a little wider out into the Mediterranean and was understood and, and, and was believed by the Gentiles in the Roman world. You see, Caesar was commonly referred to as the son of God. So, I mean, that was even written on Roman coins with Caesar's inscription, son of God. So it did serve as kind of a play on words, a, a subversive play on words, if you will, for the early Christians to call their king son of God. But we've come in recent history to begin to understand that even the earliest Christian, the Christians, those Jews who, who latched on to Jesus as being the Messiah, understood Jesus to be God's son as well. After all, Jesus did refer to himself as the Father's Son, and referred to God as Abba, Father. The term Son of God was even rooted in Jewish literature as the Psalms commonly held this language referring to Israel as God's Son, as well as the coming Messiah being prophesied among the prophets as being God's Son. When I used to teach high school, I taught Bible at a local high school, you know that, we did quite a bit of scripture memory with our students. It was a worthy discipline for sure. And one of the passages we worked on uh, each school year was the, uh, was the beautiful poem, song from Paul's letters to the Philippians. Paul's letter to the Philippians in uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. It's a, it's a poem, it's a song. And, you know, sometimes the best way we can express things that seem almost too big to express, I mean, this is Nashville, right? People take those feelings and they pick up their guitar and they figure out how to explain things. Well, poets do the same. I would argue even preachers try to do the same. Things that seem too big to express, we, we couch in poetry and songs. Paul writes this beginning in verse five, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In this passage, Paul is taking the idea that, that God is one and is including Jesus in that Oneness, And he does it as well over in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 8, verse 6. He says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from him, and, and we exist for him. And there's one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. Again, Paul is, is holding up Jesus Christ, the, the man, as being part of the oneness of God the Father. It's remarkable. And it's within these ideas from Scripture that we as Christians, we, we, uh, we face challenge. We even face criticism from those who ascribe to Islam. They point to these ideas and say, hey, look, you, you're, you're not monotheistic like you say you are. You're worshiping multiple gods. But I'm here to tell you, church, we, we, Paul is not abandoning Judaism or even monotheism. 
in these passages about who Jesus is. He's, he's leaning into what we have come to know as the doctrine of the Trinity, God as one and as three persons. And what we have going on here in what becomes our scripture, in Paul's work, in, in his life and ministry with, with other people who are coming to follow and be formed by Jesus, that they are working together all day long and then coming together at night over supper and talking about who God is and what God is like. And, and that's how these letters come to be as they're doing this all across the Mediterranean world. And what we have here amongst in these letters and beyond them are the earliest gospel conversations. The earliest Christians were, were from the Jewish world, like, like Paul was. And the Jews were expecting God to, to come back in person and to, and to rule and to reign in power and in glory. And, and, and God would return to, to live in the temple and exonerate the people who would then live in the land in power. And they, they would be vindicated. They would no longer be pushed around, dominated by pagan nations. This is what they expected. But as you know, as we now know, this didn't happen exactly as they thought it would or, or anything like they thought it would, for that matter. But it did happen. 1 John 4, 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. It just didn't happen how they anticipated. Their, their imaginations, as ours would have been as well, I suspect, were inadequate for what God actually had planned, for, for who God really is. Those of us who follow and are being formed by Jesus, we do get to live in the land exonerated. We do get to live here without fear. We get to truly live here. It, if I've successfully communicated anything to you over the last four years, I pray it would be that. That you are called to live and live well precisely because of who Jesus is and what God has done through Jesus. Truly live because of the promises that God has in store for us. Many folks looking at the events of Jesus' death and resurrection and and being led by the Holy Spirit working in and through them, they began telling those stories about what God had promised to do. And as they told their ancient stories about what God had promised to do, they found themselves telling the stories about Jesus as well and connecting the two. These were the earliest gospel conversations. They became Jesus became wrapped up in their stories about who God is, about what God had done, and about what God intends to do. So the idea of the Trinity may not have been hammered out as a theological construct for many years after Jesus lived, but it was right there on the tongues of the earliest Christians as they connected with the Father, His Father, as they connected Jesus with Him as the Father's one and only Son. And as they connected the Holy Spirit with God's continued work in the world among those following and being formed by Jesus. And the gospel caused the kingdom of God to grow. And it's amazing. And it's all because God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Within my first couple of years with you, we experienced a whole lot in our country. We experienced a pandemic, and that challenged us in so many ways. And, and then the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, it, it became a tipping point for tensions over race relations in our country. You know, from, from the time well before I began here, and even before we became a campus, one of our objectives, our goals at Brentwood Baptist has been uh, to, to, through the work of a racial unity team, to, to help with conversations, um, to help our church lead out in our world in um, helping people see God's heart for equality, for people being able to, to live fully knowing they are a child of God. 
So I felt compelled to lean into that conversation that the nation was having about race and that our church was having. And I, I admit, church, I'm still learning. I was going through a time then and, and still am now uh, through my work with uh, Hazlip School of Theology there. I was, I was being challenged um, on these issues. I was seeing things like I had never seen them. And I was leaning into this with you. And I did not always say the perfect thing to challenge or to bring everyone together. Perhaps there was not the perfect thing that could be said that could um, help the divisiveness that, that exists. These are decisive, divisive issues. Even in our kind, loving fellowship here at Harpeth Heights. But I want you to know I always had the best intentions in how I shared and couched these issues. And I'm so proud of the ways that we have um, loved and lifted up different cultures in our worship and beyond in the ways that we interact with one another, the different languages that we bring into our worship services. I have, I have long felt that so many different types of people could feel welcome worshiping with us and that this gathering in so many ways is already a picture of what Revelation tries to uphold and what God's uh, chorus of God's people will ultimately look like when God's promises do come to fruition and Jesus returns again. I, I remember hearing a story on the podcast, This American Life. I used to listen to that podcast a lot. I, I really liked it. I haven't in a while, but it was in a series of stories that they, um, they have called Kid Logic. And it was a story of a conversation. It was told by a dad and a conversation he had with his four-year-old little girl. Uh, it was Christmas time. It was the first time she had asked her dad what Christmas meant, what the holiday meant. He explained to her that Christmas was about celebrating the birth of Jesus. And she wanted to know more about this. They had talked about Jesus in their home, but she wanted to know more about it. So um, they bought a kid's Bible and her dad began to read it with her, and she loved the stories, and she wanted to know everything about Jesus, and so they read about his birth and his teachings, and her dad astutely explained to her that Jesus taught us to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, a, a good thing for our children to learn. Our children, our, our children learn it here at Harpeth Heights, straight out of Luke six thirty one, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the golden rule. And this father talked about what that meant with his daughter. And, and one day they were driving by a big church, and there was an enormous uh, cross, crucifix, outside the church. And she said, who's that? And her dad realized they had not gotten to those stories yet. Well, he said, well, that's Jesus. Jesus ran uh, afoul from the Roman government and from the Jewish authorities and ended up on the cross. And his message was, his message was so radical and unnerving that they came to the conclusion that he would have to die. So they killed him. And about a month later, after that Christmas, and um, her preschool, cel it's, it was this weekend, her preschool celebrates the same holidays as the school system. So she was off for Martin Luther King Day. And so dad took off work too and took her to lunch. And as they sat down in the diner where they were going to have lunch, the day's newspaper was there on the table, and on the front of the newspaper was a big picture of Dr. Martin Luther King. And his daughter said, who's that? He said, well, that's, that's MLK. That's, that's why you're not in school today. And she said, so who's he? And her dad said, well, well, he's a preacher. And she said, for Jesus? Her dad said, yeah, actually he was. But there was another thing he was famous for, and, and her dad said, you're, you know, you're trying to explain this to a four-year-old. But he said he was a preacher and he had a message. And she said, well, what was his message? And he said, well, that you should treat everyone the same, no matter what they look like. And she thought about that for a minute. And she said, well, that's, that's pretty much what Jesus said. And her dad said, yeah, it is. I've never really thought about it that way, but you're right. That is sort of like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the, little girl, the little girl thought about it for a moment and she looked up at her dad and she said, did they kill him too? It was the night before his death that Dr. King delivered his incredible I have come to the mountain speech. And I've stood right there in the Mason Temple in, in Memphis where he delivered that speech. 
And he said this on that night. He said, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I am not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Paul wrote, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Friends, we will make it to the promised land. Because God loves us so much. Because he gave his one and only son so we would not perish. We will make it to the promised land. Jesus gave his life for you and me so that we would live forever with the Father and with him through the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that today? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. That even in the infancy of our faith and the way you made everything different that those earliest Christians were able to to see you in Father, in Jesus, and in Holy Spirit. And that ever since then, we have been able to to walk with you, to truly live, that we have been invited into this eternal life that has already begun. And yes, Lord, things are not as they should be. Things in our own heart are not as they should be. We make poor decisions. We do not yet get things right all the time. Our selfishness goes before us more than we want it to. And we we ask you to forgive us. And at the same time, we praise you that you already have. My hope for this fellowship is that we would know the truth of your gospel explained so efficiently in this verse, John 3, 16, that you loved the world in this way, that you gave Jesus so we would not perish but live forever with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.